how serious he is about his commandments. But we'll get into that in just a, a few moments. I'm going to do quite a bit of background stuff on the Ark uh, because that isn't in Chronicles, but we need to understand what the Ark of the Covenant was, what it meant, and how important it was to the Jews. <clears throat> Before we begin, I'd like to have a word of prayer. If you would, please bow with me and we'll have that prayer. Our dear, most loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we honor you, Father, as the creator of the universe and all that we see. You are all powerful and all knowing. Father, we come to you in gratitude for all the many blessings we have in this life. We thank you for the rain we've received. We thank you for your watching care over us. We thank you that we can assemble here this morning and study your word and worship you without fear of being molested. Father, we pray that you'll be with us as we study the Old Testament, that we'll learn from it and be able to apply the lessons that we learn to our lives. We ask you to be with those of our number who are sick and unable to be here. Be with those who have been undergoing treatments and those that are still going, undergoing treatments. We pray that they will be successful. We ask you, Father, to be with our parents and help them to raise their children in your nurture and admonition. We ask you to be with our government and the leaders of our government and that they will look to you and your principles for the decisions and the directions that they take. We pray you forgive us when we sin. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> in 1 Chronicles 13, as I say, we're going to talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there's a parallel passage to this in 2 Samuel chapter 6. And uh, in a quick summary before we get into anything, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is not in Jerusalem. Uh, there's a a tent there, the temple hasn't been built yet, there's a, a, a tabernacle there, but the Ark of the Covenant is not there. And we're going to talk about how it came to not be there. But David wants to bring it back, to bring it to Jerusalem, and uh, the whole assembly of Israel is in agreement with that, and uh, so an, an effort is, is begun to bring the Ark to Jerusalem, but that effort is stopped cold when something uh, terrible happens. And we'll talk about that. That's in this chapter. But a little history. Uh, oh, before we go into the history, <clears throat> some things we want to ponder as we go through this study about the Ark of the Covenant and what's going to happen with it. Does the Lord really mean something when he says it? Does he really mean it? Even down to the nth detail. And we need to ask ourselves another question. Is it okay to try to do the right thing but do it in the wrong way? I think we'll get some insight into that question in this chapter. And a similar question, does the end justify the means? We hear this all the time. Uh, and in many people's eyes, the end does always justify the means. Perhaps the Lord doesn't have that opinion. And we'll, again, let's think about these questions as we talk about uh, chapter 13 here. Well, the Ark of the Covenant is a, a chest, if you will. Uh, the word that's translated, Ark, from the Hebrew, actually means coffin. Uh, could have been translated that way, but it's translated Ark. And we know quite a bit of details about its construction and its size and, and such. Uh, it had a, uh, what I'll call a lid on top of it, and this lid was called the mercy seat, and this mercy seat had on each end of it, as a rectangular in shape, uh, two cherubim whose wings tilted toward each other. Uh, I, f I forgot to bring my uh, PowerPoint that had pictures, well, artist depictions, of what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. There's quite a few, and uh, though we don't know if they're exactly right, <clears throat> Excuse me. Since we have uh, details as to its shape and its size and what it looked like, and it was overlaid with gold, uh, it's pretty easy to come up with an artist's artist depiction of it. The difference is that we'll see, and I'll bring it next week. Sometimes the wings tilt forward from these two cherubim and touch almost, and sometimes they're just up. And we're not told in the Bible which is correct. But there were two cherubim on, on seated on this uh, lid which is called the mercy seat, at each end of it facing each other. Uh, it was to be located when it was first built 
in the innermost room of the tabernacle called the most holy place or the holy of holies. Uh, we read in Exodus the dimensions and the directions for building it. Uh, it was made of a certain kind of wood overlaid with gold. And it had four rings of gold on the sides that uh, were used to carry it, staves or rods, if you will, were put through those and it was carried that way. Um, I wanted to read an excerpt from Exodus 25, starting in verse 13. Thou shalt make staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold. Thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be born with them. The staves shall be in the rings of the ark, and they shall not be taken from it. So before the ark was even built, some instructions were given as to how to build it, and these rings on the four corners and the staves that were to be used to stick through those rings and to be, carried, to be used to carry uh, this ark. And it, as I say, it, uh, we have, as I say, the, the extensive, and I won't go to it, I'll mention maybe in a few minutes here the dimensions. It wasn't all that big. Uh, and we might note that it was the first thing mentioned in the instructions to the Israelites when they were given the instructions for building the tabernacle. Recall in Exodus uh, 20, the Ten Commandments were given. Uh, the law was given, the whole law was given to Moses. And part of that was instructions on building a tabernacle. Uh, some great details were given in that. What it was made out of, it's what uh, size it was, uh, which direction it would face, uh, the courtyard, the things that were in the courtyard, uh, such as a, a, a fountain and an altar and... Inside the tabernacle itself, the uh, table of showbread, the candlesticks, and the tabernacle itself was split into two parts, separated by a veil. The entry, or the, when you went, went into the tabernacle, you were in the holy place, and then uh, two-thirds of the way in, there was a veil, and behind that veil was the most holy place. And only the high priest entered the most holy place once a year, on the Day of Atonement. And I say in Exodus there's some rather elaborate details concerning the tabernacle and the items within the tabernacle, what they were made of, uh, even who was to make them, and uh, as I say, which direction the tabernacle faced. Um, even with such details to say where the tribes would be in their encampment, they would be located around the tabernacle and which side, which tribe would be on. Uh, read in Exodus 26, starting verse 33. Thou, uh, well, let me read it from the New American Standard. I wanted to do that. You shall hang up the veil under the clasp and shall bring the ark of testimony there within the veil. This is behind the veil in the holy place, the most holy place, rather. And the veil shall serve for you as a partition between the holy place and the holy of holies. And you shall put the mercy seat on the ark of testimony in the Holy of Holies. So it was there inside the Holy of Holies. And this ark, as I say, was a, a chest, if you will. It contained some things. Not too many things, but it was very specific as to what it should contain. <clears throat> we read about this in the Old Testament. I wanted to read a New Testament passage concerning it. Hebrews 9, uh, starting verse 3. Behind the second veil there was a, a tabernacle which was called the Holy of Holies having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, which was a, here's what was in the Ark, a golden jar holding the manna, Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. The tables of the covenant were the tables, the rock tables, on which the Ten Commandments and the law were written. They were received by Moses, actually received twice, if you go back and read the account. Because when he came down, remember the Israelites were worshiping a golden calf, and uh, he threw the tablets down and broke them. So he had to be given those a second time after the golden calf situation was taken care of. But these tablets had the hall, the whole wall on it, and they were within uh, the ark. And we read about that <coughs> in uh, Deuteronomy 10, verses 4 and 5. In Exodus 16, 
Verse 33, we read, Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer full of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. And it would be placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And this manna never spoiled. Uh, recall what manna was. It was the food that the Israelites were given every day. Every morning they were gathered manna. <clears throat> One day's worth except on Friday and they could gather two days worth in because of the Sabbath being the next day. But there was a, a, a bowl of manna inside the ark also. And then also there was a, 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 a rod, the rod that budded. Now the incident for this was that there was a murmuring amongst the Israelites about who was to be what and Aaron had been chosen as the high priest by the Lord and so uh, men from all the tribes, all 12 tribes were uh, to put uh, get an a almond rod and uh, just a, a piece of wood and uh, at the, in the next morning we read about this in number 17 uh, it says in verse 8 the next day Moses went to the tent testimony all these rods were in there and behold the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi had sprouted and put forth, put forth buds and produced blossoms and it bore ripe alma, almonds Overnight, Well, this was to be proof for the Israelites that the tribe of Levi and Aaron uh, in particular would be the high priest. And that was also in the ark. Those three items were to be kept in the ark of the covenant. There were some other instructions concerning the ark, very specific ones given. Uh, in Numbers 3, reading verse 17, the sons of Levi by their names, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari, and in verse 39, we read, The leader of the father's households of the Kohath family, Kohathite families, Kohath was one of the sons of Levi, was El Elizaphan and the son, the son of Eziel. Now the, their duties involved the ark, the sons of Kohath, the descendants of Kohath. Their duties involved the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, and the utensils of the sanctuary with which they minister and the screen and all the service concerning them, all the things inside the tabernacle, <coughs> including the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, as an Eliezer, the son of Aaron, was the priest. Uh, the priest was chief of the leaders of Levi and had oversight of those <coughs> who performed the duties of the sanctuary. Uh, Numbers 4, we read, When the camp sets out, Aaron and his son shall go in, and they shall take down the veil of the screen and cover the Ark of the Testimony with it when they were going to move camp. Take down the veil of the screen, cover the ark of testimony with it, and they shall lay a covering of porpoise skin on it. The word porpoise there is translated in various ways by various translations. I, I don't think we really know what animal it really was. Probably hard to find a porpoise out in the middle of the Sinai Desert. But at any rate, uh, several translations translate it porpoise, but it's some kind of animal skin. Arks cover that. And then it says, they shall spread over it a cloth of pure blue, and they shall insert the poles. So these staves, these poles, will be inserted into the rings. And in verse 15 in Numbers 4, it says, when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is to set out, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them. Again, the sons of Kohath. So that they will not touch the holy objects and die so that they will not touch the holy objects and die. If they touch these things uh, that were supposed to be covered, they were to die. Uh, that's important for First Chronicles 13. Uh, in Deuteronomy 10, 8, uh, some more, these rules are more or less repeated. We read, at that time the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant. So, when the camp was to move, the ark was to be moved in a specific manner. It was to be covered up by the veil and covered up by this uh, quote-unquote porpoise skin, then by a blue cloth, the staves were put in the rod, in the rings on the corners, and the sons of Kohath were to move the ark and the other items inside the tabernacle. Uh, the ark was, I say, very important to the Israelites. Uh, it was used to lead the Israelites in various and sundry uh, times. Uh, Numbers 10, 
Verse 33, we read, Then they set out from the Mount of the Lord three days' journey, with the Ark of the Covenant journeying in front of them for the three days to seek out a resting place. And then it mentions the cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set up for camp. So when they moved camps, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was at the forefront of the uh, large entourage that was moving. And also, uh, the Ark was... All right, now if you study secular history, uh, particularly Hollywood history, I'll say, uh, I don't know if I'm a Harrison Ford fan. Remember the movie Indiana Jones and the, um, what was it, the Lost Ark? And there we go, the first one. It talked about the Ark of the Covenant there and how it uh, was its magical powers and that, you know, whole armies were wiped out because of the Ark. Well, a lot of that's a little poetic license, shall we say. But the ark was nevertheless used to lead the Israelites in various things. And on one occasion, when they were fighting the Amalekites, uh, the Lord had not told them to fight the Amalekites, but they went up anyway against the Lord, against Moses' will, and they were defeated. And uh, Moses told them, you didn't, uh, you didn't take me with you, and you didn't take the ark of the covenant with you. Thus, it's implied there that the Ark of the Covenant uh, was sometimes taken with them into battle to help them win the battle. Now, what you see in the movies, you don't find that in the Bible. Uh, I say uh, a little poetic, or maybe a lot of poetic license there. But nonetheless, the Ark was considered uh, by the Israelites to have uh, certain powers and it led them in, in more than one uh, event. When they crossed the Jordan going into Canaan, uh, when Joshua led them in Canaan, the priests were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and when they stepped into the waters of Jordan, the water stopped. Then they went out to the middle of the river and stood there and waited while the Israelites crossed the Jordan. And then the Ark went out of the river, there was carried out, and then the water started flowing again. And the first city that was conquered inside of uh, Canaan, Jericho, Recall the uh, events of how Jericho was, was destroyed. For six days, the Israelites would march around in silence uh, the city. And that march was led by the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And of course, on the seventh day, they went around seven times, raised a shout, and the walls fell down. But nonetheless, there was the Ark again, uh, helping them to and leading them as they marched around Jericho and as it fell. <clears throat> the next city that the uh, Israelites tried to take the Canaan was Ai, and the first time they tried to take it, they failed uh, because they didn't inquire of the Lord. And read about that in Joshua 7, 6, after the defeat and uh, several Israelites being killed, we read, Joshua tore his clothes and fell down to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. So again, uh, the mercy seat in the tabernacle was, was the place where the Lord uh, uh, figuratively sat. And that's where the priest went in, I say, one day a year on the Day of Atonement. And uh, Joshua fell down for the ark to pray to the Lord because they had suffered defeat at Ai. So again, the uh, Ark of the Covenant is, is there playing a role. Later on, uh, Joshua would read the entire law to the Israelites at Mount Ebal. And we've read about this in Joshua 8, verses 30 through 35. Joshua built an altar, and then he would read the entire law. He would take the stones out of the ark, and he stood beside the, law, uh, stood beside the ark as he read the entire law to the Israelites. Uh, more than once, the Israelites had the whole law read to them. And uh, every, everybody, uh, men, women, and children, they would hear it. And uh, on this occasion, Joshua reads it to them, and he's standing by the Ark of the Covenant. As the Israelites went into Canaan and began to conquer it, the tabernacle and the Ark would end up being at Shiloh, the city of, uh, town of Shiloh. Uh, and there it would remain for the duration of the conquest. But how did it come? And then after uh, the conquest, uh, well, 
After the conquest, of course, the Israelites occupied Canaan, but they still had enemies surrounding them. One of those enemies was the Philistines. And this starts to get us up to the point where the reason why the ark is not in Jerusalem in David's day and why it needs to come back. The Philistines had uh, raided uh, Israel. We'll read about this in 1 Samuel 4. And Israel uh, fought them and lost. And they lost about 4,000 4, men killed. So the Israelites decided to take the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them against the Philistines. They did this without consulting uh, the Lord. But it led them to so many things in the past, I guess they thought, this will help us defeat these Philistines. Well, they would do so. And when the Philistines heard about this, that the Ark was going to be coming to the next battle, they were fearful. Uh, recall when the Israelites came into Canaan, the Canaanites, probably more than the Israelites, were fearful of the God of the Israelites because they remember what happened to the Egyptian army. Well, the Philistines have heard about all the battles that the Israelites have won. They've heard about the Ark of the Covenant, and they are fearful. Uh, but it says they gathered their courage and went out to battle against the Israelites, and again they defeated the Israelites, and 30,000 Israelites were killed in this battle, including... Uh, the son, two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas, as they were sons of Eli. Remember Eli and Samuel? Uh, Eli had raised Samuel. Now at this time, Eli is an old man, uh, but he's still alive. His sons are in the battle. They are killed, and the Ark of the Covenant is taken by the Philistines. Well, uh, we also read in 1 Samuel 7, two or three chapters later, that at this time the Israelites, since they hadn't removed all the Canaanites from the land, many of them had taken up the uh, practice of worshiping idols. Nonetheless, uh, they've taken the ark into battle without consulting with the Lord. They've been defeated. The ark has been taken by the Philistines. When word gets back to Eli that the ark was taken, and it says he was an old man and large. He fell over backwards, broke his neck, and died. Phineas' wife, uh, one of his sons, who was about to give birth, when she heard that the ark had been taken, it says she went into labor and died after giving birth to a son. And she, before, right short before she died, she named that son Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. And her last words were apparently, the glory has departed from Israel for the Ark of God was taken. So the Ark of the Covenant is no longer in the possession of the Israelites. It's in the possession of the Philistines. This great icon of Israeli power, the Israelites' power, is no longer with them. The Philistines have it. And in 1 Samuel 5 and 6, we read about the uh, events that occurred after they took it. The Philistines are going to pay a price for capturing this Ark. First, they took it to the house of Dagon, their main god, to put it there. They set it in the temple of Dagon. And the next morning, uh, the idol of Dagon, which was right next to the ark, had been, was fallen over. It fell over by itself during the night. So they set it up. And so you can read about this in 1 Samuel 5 and 6. They set it up, uh, and it did it again. And they set it up again. And the third time it fell, it says, the head and the hands broke off. Now, Dagon was a, uh, an idol. It had the body of a fish and the uh, head and arms of a man. And when it fell over the third time, the head and arms broke off. So all that's left there is a body of a fish, if you will. Well, the Philistines uh, were puzzled by this, but then some more things happened. They had a plague of what's called tumors uh, in the Bible and a plague of mice. Mice were everywhere. And so they decided we better move this ark out of the temple of Dagon to another city. So they did so. And what happens? The tumors and the mice follow the ark. And that city starts to suffer these plagues. So uh, they decide we got to get rid of this thing. We got to give it back to the Israelites, get it back to them somehow. So what they do is they build a new cart and they get uh, 
uh, two uh, milk cows to tow it, and they make five golden tumors and five golden mice, put them in the cart, and they take this cart back to the city of the Israelites to get rid of it and all the problems it's causing them. Obviously, the Lord didn't intend for them to have it. Well, <clears throat> read that uh, again in 1 Samuel 5 and 6. Uh, they took it back to a, a city of the Israelites named Beth Shemesh. And the Israelites there were very happy to get the ark. But uh, when they got, got it, it wasn't covered. And they looked upon it. And we read that they would pay a price for that, as in 1 Samuel 6. Uh, they looked on the ark, and the Lord struck down several thousand of them. Now, depending on which translation you read, it's either uh, uh, 5,000 or 50,000. Uh, again, depending on which translation you read. Most Hebrew uh, texts that we have indicate 50,000. Nonetheless, several thousand Israelites died because they looked at the ark when they weren't supposed to. It wasn't covered properly. Uh, so they bring it. It's there in uh, Beth Shemesh. They will send it to another town named kiriath Jerem and put it in the house of a man named Abinadab. And there it will stay. And it will stay there for 20 years. Uh, during this 20 years, now, this battle that the, was fought with the Philistines that the Israelites had lost was when King Saul, was, when Saul was still king. Uh, another one of the missteps that Saul took while he was king. He allowed that to happen. But after the 20 years, Saul has been killed in battle. David is now the king. And uh, David is now, we are up to the point in time in 1 Chronicles 13, David wants to bring the ark to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is now his, his capital. Recall, I believe last week we said it was called Jebus, and Joab killed the first Jebusite, and uh, David would then occupy Jebus, which it was then called Jerusalem. But we read in chapter 13 of 1 Chronicles, David consulted with the captains of the thousands and the hundreds, even with every leader, and David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it's from the Lord our God, and he's going to consult with the Lord too, let us send everywhere to our kinsmen who remain in the land of Israel, also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their cities and pasture lands, that they may meet with us, and let us bring back the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. Uh, Saul was the king when the ark was lost, but he didn't even try to get it back. And it had it not been for the plagues that the Lord put on the Philistines, it would have still been probably the house of Dagon. Uh, but the Philistines had got it back to the Israelites because they wanted to just get rid of it because all the problems it was solving. But Saul had not even tried to get it back. But David now wants to bring it back. In verse 4, we read, Then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. And this was a good thing to do. Bring the ark back to uh, the tabernacle and put it back in the Holy of Holies where it belongs. Well, uh, go on down to verse 7. Well, we go, well, let's read verses 5, 6, 7. So David assembled all Israel together from the Shinar of Egypt even to the entrance of Hamath to bring the ark of God from kiriath Jerem. And David and all Israel went to Baalat that is, to carry a Jerem, which belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord who is enthroned above the cherubim, where his name is called. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahio drove the cart. So they built a new cart. Uh, I forgot to mention the, the cart that the Philistines had built when they delivered the ark, the Israelites took that cart and took it apart and used the wood uh, to make an altar and make an offering to the Lord. And they offered up those two milk cows as an offering to the Lord. But now it's been there in the house of Benadab for 20 years. And now uh, David and the Israelites go down to get it. And they build a new cart. 
and they put it on there, and the two men driving the car are named Uzzah and Ahio. And we're reading verse 8. It's a happy occasion. Everybody's happy for a while. Verse 8 says, And David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, even with songs, with lyres, harps, tambourine, cymbals, and trumpets. So it's a big celebration. They've got the ark back. It's on the way back to Jerusalem. But the next verse tells us there is a problem. Verse 9, When they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark because the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down before, because he put his hand out to the ark, and he died there before God. Remember the rules that we read. The sons of Kohath, of the tribe of Levi, were to transport the ark. They were to use those staves and our poles and the rings and carry it that way. It was not to be carried in a cart. It was to be carried by foot, on foot by the sons of Kohath. Well, they're not doing it in the right way, and they're not doing it with the right tribe. And now when the ark is upset by the oxen, going over a bump, I suppose, Uzzah puts out his hand to steady the ark, a seemingly innocent act, but it says the anger of the Lord burned against him and he struck him dead. Now here we may have to ask a question, what did Uzzah do that was wrong? Should he have let it fall? Well, you might say no. The question you have to ask is, should Uzzah have been doing that in the first place? And the obvious answer is no, he should not have. Uh... Read on here in the next verse. <clears throat> then David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah. David is angry because Uzzah, a seemingly innocent man, has been struck dead and David is angry. Uh, I think it's interesting to note, uh, it doesn't say he was angry at the Lord. He's just angry. He's not a happy person. And he names the place... Uh, Perez Uzzah, uh, which uh, means uh, Uzzah has stumbled, Uzzah has fallen. Well, verse 12 then tells us David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God home to me? So even though David was angry, he's not very angry with the Lord, I don't think. I think he's angry at the events that happened. But he's afraid of the Lord and asks himself, how can I do this? What can I do? How can I get it back to me? Uh, well, so verse 13 says, So David did not take the ark with him to the city of David, but took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Thus the ark remained with the family of Obed-Edom in, in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the family of Obed-Edom with all that he had. So the attempt to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem fails in a rather miserable manner. We're going to find out when we get to chapter 15. David, uh, if he didn't know at that moment, he would find out soon why what had happened had happened. He knows why. Uh, again, recall the instructions, the very specific instructions given to the Israelites concerning the tabernacle, concerning the Ark of the Covenant, concerning its transport, who was to do what. Uh, we'll come back to all that, but I want to quickly cover the events of chapter 14. Then we're going to come back to 13 and ask ourselves some of those questions I asked at the beginning. As I say, chapter 14 is kind of an aside. While uh, we stop this event of getting the Ark back to the Covenant, there's a three-month lull, if you will, then we have this inserted chapter about uh, some of the other things that are happening to David at this point in time. Uh, Hiram, the king of Tyre. Now Tyre is a, a seacoast town up to the north of, of Israel. Uh, elsewhere in the Bible, we read about Tyre and Sidon. And uh, they play a role in the history of the Israelites, and they play a role in the history of the world, too. Uh, and some of it good, some of it not so good. 
But Hiram is the king of Tyre. He sends messengers to David. This is in verse 1 of chapter 14. He sent messengers to David with the cedar trees, masons, and carpenters to build a house for him. So uh, Hiram, the king of Tyre, uh, apparently thinks well of David. And recall, after David became king, and even before he became king, his name was known throughout Israel because he was very successful in battle. Remember, he killed a, Saul killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. Well, word of David spreads not only throughout Israel, but throughout all the nations around Israel. Uh, the Philistines know of David. The uh, men of Tyre and Sidon know about David. The Moabites do, the Ammonites do. All those nations around about Israel know of David, and they revere him, they fear him. Hiram now sends uh, cedar trees, masons, and carpenters to build a house for him. Tyre is uh, in the uh, uh, area that's known as Lebanon, and we read about the cedars of Lebanon. Now, I don't believe today there are too many of those left. I think most of them got cut down, but in the days of David, there were many, many cedar trees in the hills of Lebanon, and uh, Hiram now sends a bunch of this wood down to David, helping him build a house. And when this happens, in verse 2, we read, David realized the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. David is respected even amongst the heathen nations. Even the king of Tyre uh, respects David. So David now moves into Jerusalem. It mentions he takes more wives in Jerusalem. He has more sons in Jerusalem. It lists several of his sons there. Uh, and he more or less establishes himself in Jerusalem. And he will... Uh, going to be building himself a house made of these cedars. Uh, this will play a role in David's life later on when he realizes, I live in a fine house and the Ark of the Covenant uh, is in a tent. And he wants to build a house for the Lord. Uh, we'll get to that later on in our study about what he does to try to do that. But at any rate, uh, continue on chapter 14. We read, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king, uh, all the Philistines went up in search of David, and David uh, would go out and fight them in battle, and he will defeat them. But I want to note in verse 10, the Philistines, verse 9 says, the Philistines made a raid in the Valley of Rephaim. Before David goes into battle, what does he do? David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? And wilt I give them into my hand? Before he goes out to fight, he inquires of the Lord. This is something that Saul had ceased to do uh, at the end of his reign. But David inquires of the Lord, asking him, shall I do this? Shall I go out there? And the Lord says in the end of that verse, go up for I will give them into your hand. So, next verse says they, they came up to Baal Perism. David defeated them from there, and David said, God has broken through my enemies by my hand like the breakthrough of the waters. So David gives the uh, credit for the victory to the Lord. And it mentions there the Philistines had abandoned their gods there. They had uh, idols that they carried with them in, in the battle and encampment. And verse 12 says, uh, David gave the order, and they were burned with fire. So David destroys all these idols. Well, the Philistines will try another time. The next verse says they'll try another raid in the Valley of Rephaim. The Valley of Rephaim is just outside of Jerusalem. They're coming up Philistia from the southeast or southwest, and they will try to defeat the Israelites and then take Jerusalem, their capital city, if you will. And in verse 14, we read again, David inquired again of God, and God said to him, uh, it's a little different answer this time. David wants to know, shall I go out against them? And the Lord says, you shall not go up after them, but circle around from behind them and come up them from the balsam trees. So he tells him, you know, you don't go out against them face to face, frontal assault. You go around them and attack them from the rear. Uh, and verse 15 says, this is the Lord speaking, and it shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then you should go out to battle. For God will have gone out before you to strike the enemy of the Philistines. 
So he's told to go into battle, but not quite the same battle plan. Instead of going out and facing them in a frontal assault, he used to go out, come around from behind them, and when they hear the sound of marching in these trees or these bushes, as they're called in some translations, then they're to attack. Well, in verse 16, we read, David did just as God had commanded him, and they struck down the army of the Philistines from Gibeon as far as Gezer. Then the fame of David went to all the lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him on all the nations. David's already known these nations. Now, after defeating these Philistines in two uh, major battles, he's, his fame spreads throughout the whole land, uh, not just Israel, but all the lands around. And so... Uh, indeed, David is popular and well-known. Uh, and now he's going to be able to build a house for himself with the wood that Hiram has sent him. Um, now, I want to go back to chapter 13. Now, you say chapter 14 is kind of inserted there to help us understand the power of David and the, the uh, widespread knowledge of him and that David always inquires of the Lord. Uh, throughout David's life, even when David made mistakes and he realized that he would always go back to the Lord and ask the Lord's forgiveness. This was something that uh, Saul, his predecessor, ceased doing. And because of that, because Saul took things into his own hands he shouldn't have, his, his family would no longer be of the, uh, no longer rule Israel. David always does. And his son, later on Solomon, will continue to rule. And uh, as a matter of fact, David's lineage will continue on to Christ. Uh, if you go to read the gener generations of the genealogy of Jesus in, in Matthew and Luke, uh, David is there. Uh, Saul is not. And recall that uh, many years before, when Jacob had blessed his sons, he had told Judah that the, the scepter will not depart from Judah. It will not depart from you. And Jesus himself will be called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So David will ensure that legacy continues. Even though he's not a perfect man, he always inquires of the Lord. All right, real quickly here, I asked some questions at the beginning. Does the Lord really mean what he says, all that he says? Did the Lord really mean it when he said, you better carry this ark this way? Well, Uzzah found out the hard way the Lord meant exactly that. Uzzah was not of the tribe of Levi. He was not of the sons of Kohath. They did not use staves to can't transport it. They were transported on a cart. They were not to touch it, and he touched it. Now, he may have thought he was doing what was right, but they were trying to do something that was a good thing, a right thing, but they were doing it in a wrong way. And Uzzah paid with his life because he was trying to do something that he thought was right, but doing it the wrong way. Uh, we need to consider when we do something, even if it's the right thing to do, how we're going about it. And especially when we consider spiritual things. There are right ways and wrong ways to do almost everything, but we need to be considerate of how we do things. And when the Lord gives us instructions, he means for us to follow them. We could go into our worship. You know, our worship in the New Testament, we're told to sing and make melody in your heart. To sing. It doesn't say anything about a band. It doesn't say anything about playing an instrument. It says sing. And because that's all it says, that's all we should do. Now, what if we try to go beyond that? What if we try to touch that instrument, touch that Ark of the Covenant as, as Uzzah did? We need to look to the Old Testament and understand we can learn from it. That when the Lord says something, he means what he says. Concerning the transport of the Ark of the Covenant, he meant what he said. Uzzah paid with his life. In chapter 15, we'll find out that David realized the mistake he had made, and he will go back to get the Ark, but try to do it the right way. Uh, so... It was right for the get the ark back to Jerusalem, back in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle, but it was done in the wrong manner, and the price was paid by Uzzah. And it says David was angry, but again it says he was fearful of the Lord then. And he will again try to do it, but he'll try to do it in the right way later on. 
similar question I asked, does the end justify the means? I believe the Bible tells us we need to be very careful about how we do everything we do. Uh, spiritual matters, of course, but even everything else. We need to do things in the right way. That's not what the world tells us in many cases. They'll look at a result and say, as long as you get here, I don't care how you got here, as long as you get here. Well, maybe it does make a difference as to how we get to a certain point. It certainly mattered as to how the Ark of the Covenant got back to the, temp the tabernacle. It made a difference. Things we need to consider. Look at the Old Testament, the examples we have, and learn about how we should live our lives. Uh, and does the Lord mean everything he says? Yeah, he does. Does the Lord mean it when he says such things like uh, homosexuals would not be entered into the kingdom of heaven? Does he really mean that? Did he really mean, is the Lord that mean-spirited? Well, he said it, didn't he? I believe he meant it just as I mean he meant just what he said. That's just one example. Our society today accepts these things now. Uh, what's about marriage? Uh, we have you know multiple marriages today. Now, under the law of Moses, we read in the New Testament, God allowed it because of their hardness of heart. But that wasn't his intent. He intended one man and one woman. Note it doesn't say one man and one man. Unfortunately, today in our country, uh, that is accepted in some states. Well, you know, it doesn't matter what the state accepts. What it matters is what the Lord accepts. And when it comes down to it, we need to put ourselves in the position of the Israelites, moving the ark, if you will. Make sure we're doing things the way the Lord wants us to do it. Uh, there are many instructions in the Bible, both Old and New Testament, about how a husband and a wife should treat each other. We need to pay attention to those. Do exactly what it says. A man should love his wife as much as he loves himself, as much as Christ loved the church. And how much was that? What did Christ do for the church? He died for it. That means a man should love his wife enough to die for her. Now, if he's, he loves her that much, he's not going to be treating her badly. He's not going to be beating her. He's not going to be abandoning her. He's going to take care of her. There's even a passage in the Old Testament that says, a man should spend an entire year when he first gets married just making his wife happy. Think about that. But again, we learn from the Old Testament that God means what he says. When he says it, he means it. We change it, we will suffer the consequences. Us have suffered consequences. If we change God's laws, we will suffer too. Some things to think about. Next week, we'll go back to the Ark of the Covenant and try to get it into Jerusalem from uh, Kiriath-Jerim. So thank you for your attention, and we'll see you next week.